I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love. Now, stories have been retold and embellished, iterated and built upon for centuries. Films have been remade and rebooted for decades. Updating an idea for the audience of the time is nothing new. However, the prevalence of remakes in the late 2010s concerns me, as chances discarded, the shock of the new recoiled from, in favour of familiarity, safe bets and sure things that make cinema just that little less weird, and myself just a little less hopeful of seeing something that I've never seen before. All of which brings me to today's subject, the 2010 remake of Clash of the Titans. While this movie bears the name of the 1981 original, the story is radically different. This time, Perseus isn't set against Kalavos and a few nondescript minions, but the very underworld itself, and the master of death, Lord Hades. And while the 1981 original holds a 68% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, this remake scored just 28%. I've got my own views on the caprice of film critics, but we'll skip that. Instead, come with me, my friends, as we return to ancient Greece, where heaven and hell collide in Clash of the Titans, the remake. I give you Perseus. Adopted son of Fisherman Spyros, who bears witness to the return of Hades. Long story short, before the gods there were the Titans. Zeus, Poseidon and Hades were the children of the Titans, and they looked to overthrow their forebears. Hades had a child too, the Kraken. Together, the three brothers overthrew the Titans. But then Zeus tricked Hades into ruling the underworld, while he and Poseidon lived it up in Olympus. Jerk move. <laughs> Hades pleads the case for divine intervention to his brother Zeus. I need to be reminded of the order of things. Back on Earth? in celebration of Argos waging war on the gods, Queen Cassiopeia praises her daughter's beauty above the gods themselves. With predictable consequences. Hades sees a perfect opportunity to punish the mortals, and threatens to loose the Kraken in ten days' time at the Eclipse, if Princess Andromeda is not sacrificed. Yes, ten days, not thirty like before. They ain't messing around this time. And for Perseus, who is revealed to be a demigod. Of your father. Enter Io, with the tale of Perseus's true lineage. For you see, it was Acrisius, former king of Argos, that made war on the gods for their cruel and capricious natures. Zeus thought to make an example of King Acrisius, by disguising himself in Acrisius's form, and impregnating the then queen. Acrisius denied Zeus by having both queen and godsborn thrown to the sea, where Perseus was found by fisherman Spyros. But what of Acrisius? Why is he no longer king? Well, we'll get to that. And so, our hero is conscripted. But Hades plans in secret against his brother and Calabos shall be his weapon. Calabos, ruined and terrible form of King Acrisius, who was hit by a bolt of Zeus's lightning the night he sent his queen and her godspawn to the sea. So yeah, not a great outcome for anyone in all this. Perseus learns how to handle a weapon, which is lucky when he finds a sword of the gods. Then, Calabos appears. But he's no match for divine steel. And neither are the scorpions formed from his blood. <laughs> but their venom is enough to put down even a demigod. 
Lucky then that the jinn are willing to help. Oh man. Poison is serious business. Don't think that I've ever seen it drawn out with fire before though. Oh no, hang on, there might have been that one time. And so our heroes reach the Stygian witches. The knowledge demands payment! But Perseus is having none of it, and gets the answer he seeks. And so our heroes step on the boat to Medusa's temple, and Io recounts the true tale of the Gorgon. Once, Medusa was beautiful. Beautiful enough to turn the eye of even a god. Poseidon wanted her, but she wasn't so keen on him. Medusa hid in the temple of Athena, which didn't protect her. When Poseidon had his wicked way with her on the temple floor, she prayed to Athena for comfort, but Athena felt only disgust for Medusa, and turned her into a snake demon whose gaze petrified. Disgraceful. Absolutely disgusting. I mean, I... I'll spare you the rent. And after an inspiring speech from Perseus, the squad enter the Temple of the Gorgon, whose gaze petrifies. Which goes about as well as you'd expect. But our hero is a demigod, and one-shots the Gorgon with a beautiful dismount. Only for Calibos to play mini-boss to the Kraken once more. Don't become one of them. And just when all looks lost, our hero rides for Argos. And despite Hades' best efforts to stop him, Perseus braves the Kraken's devastation to petrify the beast and send his uncle back to the underworld. Such is the legend of Perseus, son of Zeus. So that was Clash of the Titans, the remake. And actually, I'm going to put this one into my house of love. So let's get this out of the way right now. This remake is dirtier and grittier than the pristine costumed theatrical original. It's darker as well, more down at heel, far less bay and camp, much more macho, and much more of an ensemble, as the second hour of the original movie became the entirety of this one. But is this movie as slow as the original? Well if it is, it's certainly a little more fleshed out. Perseus, Calabos, the honor guard assigned to our hero, and token woman Io. They all actually have character here, so that you feel something when most of them die to Medusa. But as an action movie, this movie has been afflicted with a severe debt of likability. Sam Worthington's Perseus, cropped and gruff, is more lucky coal miner than shining demigod. Mads Mikkelsen's commanding officer Draco is equally as dour. Even as he attempts to bright slap some divinity into our hero, Liam Cunningham's Solon is the prototypical sergeant character, and Nicholas Holt the nervy rookie. That's not to say that these roles are at all phoned in, far from it, and the addition of Gemma Arterton's Io to the mix, who even gets some action cred, is very welcome. The flow of this movie is much less like Treacle, though the plot points of modern Hollywood do loom large. Tragic backstory, gruff military squad, comedy foreigners, in the form of the two hunters. But through all this, we're mainly focused on the heroes and their quest, apart from a few digressions to further the plot. So is it better than the original? Well, it's certainly flashier. Modern CG in the era of the virtual camera fulfill the promise of a winged horse, and the thrilling roller coaster sequence of Pegasus riding through Argos City is a treat for the eyes. But better? That all depends on your definition. It's dour, for the most part, but the effects are stunning. Liam Neeson is no Laurence Olivier, but then Harry Hamlin was no Sam Worthington. So did it deserve its 28%? No. It's not a bad movie, by my definition. It's unerringly acted, the effects are good, and while it does look a little video gamey at times, it's a movie I'd watch again, which isn't something I could say of the original. So then, to sum up, if you're looking for a sword and sandals action fest, it's right here. 
If it's camp you're after, then the 1981 original is your best bet. But of the two, I prefer this one. The camaraderie is slightly by the numbers, and it's a rougher, tougher ancient Greece. But it holds the attention in a way the original didn't. So stuff the critics, switch off your brain, and enjoy Clash of the Titans, the remake. So thanks for watching. If you liked this video, why not consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell? And if you want to be extra awesome, check out my crowdfunding links in the description below. But for now, I've been Funky Monkey, wishing you memorable days and forgotten gems. So long, folks!